Hello everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. My voice has found the world in a unique way tonight. And so I was wondering about the nature of reality And I was also wondering about the architecture of buildings. And for the first time, I wondered, what is the foundation? What is holding our reality? And my mind playfully conceived pillars. And of course, I've I've given this talk that it's one of my my personal favorites of my own talks. (laughs) But it's, uh, it's called Wisdom of the Hidden Pillar. And so it's this idea that it's actually abstract pillars that are holding our tangible objective reality, abstract subjective pillars. You know, I remember like, uh, I think it was two years ago, I was um, by Tim Hortons having a coffee in the morning, sitting at this bench outside. And there was this man who comes and sits beside me And uh, the guy looks like an artist. Literally, he has like this unique like scarf and a hat and uh, uh, these sunglasses that are tinted, you know. And uh, I remember we're there and he starts talking. And so I think at the time I was writing a recording. I, I don't know if I was recording a talk, you know, if it was one of those interruptions of the talk or I was writing something. And so the guy, I remember one thing he said was that the, out of nowhere he said, read, study Noam Chomsky. Go listen to as much as Noam Chomsky as possible, you know. And then the guy left, you know. And there were other things discussed. I remember asking him about his art career. I wanted to pursue such a path. And uh, he was a painter, oil, oil canvas painter. And so I remember he said, listen to as much as Noam Chomsky as possible, and he left. And it felt as if he was trying to give something, you know, and he was trying to, uh, you you see, sometimes people give you physical things, and sometimes they give you pointers, abstract pointers. And if you follow those abstract pointers, there can be the emergence of new data or new content, or you suddenly figure out there's somebody else out there, you know that you haven't heard and <clears throat> and whatnot. So anyways, and I remember uh, at the time, because I was so curious about language, I would I was acquainted to Noam, Ch- Noam Chomsky, but I wasn't listening to him. You know, there is, uh, ad- ad- admiration is a different level than uh, understanding. Let me tell you why. Because understanding is like becoming another comrade on the battlefield, but admiration means that the other person is still in the front lines. You know, so it's, it's like there's a way of knowledge where teachers, uh, teach, uh, the student, uh, the, the student listens to the teacher or the teacher or the, uh, or the, stu- uh, um, the teacher listens to, sees what the student wants or the student sees what the teacher wants. <clears throat> anyways, anyways, let me not go too much on a tangent. <laughs> It's too early for this talk to spiral. (laughs) Noam Chomsky, he said something that is very relevant to my title here. He said that it's as if 99% uh, or like a vast majority, major usage of language is internal. It It is of the subjective. What does that mean? That means you are an objective being. We'll grant you, we'll grant this. Yes, you are a, let's say you have a physical body, you're an objective being, but the world that you experience from the moment you wake up to the moment you sleep, <clears throat> it's inner. It's a relationship between the inner and outer realm. If I was to explain my life to you, it, is, it, it has been that. When I speak, my inner realms are in view. When, I, when, I, when I'm silent, my outer realms is the only thing in view. And life animates in different ways. And it's the study. It's the study of forgetting. It's like the next superior thing beyond language, which seems to be um, the face of the educational system, is experience. That means pretty much you either don't study, you study... <laughs> 
Language or you study experience? Direct experience or indirect language? <clears throat> My point is that our use of language as human beings is very vastly internal. A lot of things that I share with you, you know, for example, even, even if a person studies history, like that history major's value <laughs> is what he subjectively considers was. And when I realized that we are not thoughts, that we are not the ideas that visit our minds. Whether in winter nights or summer days. There is an attention that is untouched by the emergence of the thought and the coming and going of it. Once you're grounded in that attention, then what happens is it's like the satellite antenna of, or let's say that your phone signal uh, you, step out, you step out of the parking lot and suddenly the phone signal's there. That's the thing. For me, life is, there's not, what is knowledge? Is, you can say it's on some level the compartmentalization of the unknown, of ways that the unknown has been defined and segmented. So what does that mean? That means individual consciousness must be engaged in the process of individualization to remain. And collective consciousness must be engaged in the process of collective, uh, what's the term, let's say collectivization. The whole point is that really what are we looking at here on this planet? It's a rock in the middle of nowhere. There are creatures, these creatures harbor inner realms. Their inner realms change in accordance to the sophisticated mouth noises we make, which is the language. And so really what it is, is that we are creatures that first built with objects and now we are building our lives and this is a very beautiful idea. We are building our lives as subjects of our experience. That means I don't know how many people look at life and feel as if it is the masterpiece of their energetic effort and existence. You know, it's like <clears throat> I, I respect Buddhism. You know, I respect yo um, yoga, you know. Vedanta, but let me tell you. This life is not to get rid of the dancing shoes you're given, but it is to dance with them. You, you have been provided after 4 billion years of evolution with a position, with, with an evolutionary position of acknowledgement. That means if there was an extraterrestrial invasion, invasion, all the animals on the planet Earth will look at man and be like you who see the most. What will you do? And so that's the responsibility, pretty much what Spider-Man, what Uncle Ben <laughs> said to Spider-Man, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, kiddo. <laughs> that's the thing, with great, uh, with an advanced pra uh, brain comes the responsibility for an advanced civilization, that is it. In other words, pretty much what life is, it's an appearance of forms that now, for the, not for the first time, but have developed to such an advantage. I don't want to say we're, it's like on one view, I got to look at the future generations and tell them go further. And I got to look at the uh, past generations and be like, your service was enough. Thank you. You know, it's like the mentality divides when one wants to speak to the, uh, to the human. But, but on, 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 a, on a level of, like, let me tell you, my thinking starts off like this, where I look at a phenomena. So, for example, like, there's a cup in front of me, this Tim Hortons coffee cup, right? So I'm looking at this cup. <clears throat> I'm looking at this object. And right now, as I'm looking at this object, I'm spinning it with my hand to get a full view of all the angles of it. And sometimes when I speak... It, it's, it's a similar experience with the subjectivity, but it's not my hand spinning. It's my attention uh, uh, perceiving the same thought in different ways. You know, so the more multidimensionally you can say your perception can become, 
uh, the, uh, the more multidimensional the outcome would be. So right now, this is the mystery. We are, our, our mainstream is thinking that the cause was in a singular dimension, but how is the effect multidimensional? Mr. Within is saying the cause was multidimensional. It's just a temporary effect that we feel it's all a singular dimension, you know? And multidimensionality is, is, how can I tell you? It doesn't matter if you have infinite dimensions in the void or if you have one dimension in the void. <clears throat> the cool thing about the void is that it's void. <laughs> you know? They asked Buddha about emptiness and he was silent. And they're like, okay, that makes sense. That's the perfect answer. <laughs> So I find that these archetypes, these senses of self that we as human beings journey through, they, these are abstract pillars and reference points for the experience of greater uh, planes of <clears throat> experience. Okay, so welcome to the chat, Andre. Uh, I don't know what you mean by mithril mysteries. Is that something? Mithril is that like uh, old English mythology or something? Like yeah, I, I have no idea what you mean, but um. <laughs> Pretty much I'm saying that you are an architect um, when, you, when you're using the term uh, <clears throat> So guys, uh, I'm going to continue on. Uh, Andre, if you can elaborate a bit more, maybe share more imagery of what you see, uh, I might be able to uh, comment. Um, but anyways, I'll continue. Uh, pretty much the mind, uh, I have this very unique way of explaining. Let me tell you. Uh, if I was to ask, or how, gonna, how would I say it? If somebody came up to me, I was like walking, you know, sitting in a park. Somebody came up to me and they're like, Mr. Within, how does psychology happen? for the human. <laughs> I would say that the mind, when the child is born, is not trying to be an individual. The mind has no influence. It's just trying to stabilize as phenomena. And there's a temperature reality. So what does that mean? That means you as a human being, all your emotions have, have stretched from the earliest experiences of you as a baby trying to find the right temperature to be, to be stabilizing. To stabilize for the attention to be stabilized in so that means it's like when somebody leaves you it's as if it's a cold moment it's as if you're going through the winter of your heart you know when somebody finds you it's as if you know dawn has come at the right moment so 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 it's uh, you know there's um anyways the psychology of the child is not being an individual i feel that what's happening the moment the doctor slaps the child the newborn baby's back and it starts breathing the, the moment the lungs activate, I feel it's literally like we've we successfully connected the router to uh, the Wi-Fi, <laughs> to the Wi-Fi of nature, you know? <clears throat> so what I mean by that is that the mind of the child is first trying to be the world. 
And once it establishes itself as a subjective world, it starts extracting based on parents and society and civilization interacting with the child to becoming an individual. Ultimately, if somebody says, what's the point of growing up? You know, imagine you're a young kid asking this. The point of growing up is that you have eyes as a being. These eyes give access to sensory data, but this sensory data is not the end of the sight. There is a, a, a sort of adding opinionship uh, behind the mind, a sort of added opinionship. Ship. What, what, <laughs> what do I mean by that? That means when I say the word apple, the image that, for example, comes to your mind of apple is, that, is, 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 is the way your mind's been conditioned. You know, I may say apple and somebody may think of Newton and somebody may think, think that the apple is in the hand of Eve. You see, this is my grand realization, guys. This is one thing that, like, is the point of the, the, these Mr. Within talks. That I realized before language became static truth for me, there was a dynamic, unknown experience going on. And the best way I would say true mysticism feels like for the hidden heart is that it is suddenly realizing That the mind, the individual mind, has nowhere left to go. Either it enters the void or it remembers it is all that it can see to be. That is it. It's just identity. It, it's like, <clears throat> I find evolution to be weather. Right now we're experiencing a certain patterned movement of nature. There is no telling how many civilizations. By the way, guys, there is no telling about the time, the time of the universe. Because there is no telling It's pretty much, we, it's like trying to tell, trying to put time to the universe is like being in a dark room and trying to define what's on the walls. There may be a faint sight based on the candle of one's consciousness of what kind of room this plane of existence may appear as. You know, it oscillates. In certain moments of history, it was thought to be an inner room. In certain moments of history, it was thought to be an outer room. But the reason I say in 2020 we're pilots is because we are conscious of both. We have the best of both worlds. It's as if the atheist and the theist in their, in their confrontations manage to leave behind uh, a sort of weapon and a shield. What does that mean? That means faith shields you from consequence. The intellect shields you <coughs> from the ignorance of the cause. Or I can say the faith shields you, the intellect pierces through. It's, it's honestly this. It's, like a, it's just like, it's like nature has held a pen and is writing and the pen has suddenly become conscious and it's like, holy shit, how am I moving? 
You know, it's like, aren't I just atoms in space? How do I have free will? How is it that language, uh, the use and the capacity for language for the human being is on a whole other level than, for example, for other species? You know, it's like you can teach a, a human child language and have it enter such a sophisticated projection of reality as civilization. But regardless of a lion or any other, you know, let's say, Uh, less evolved life form you know it's like you can try to teach your alphabet to a baby lion cub and that lion cub will grow up and the person would add, would add command you know ask the lion to repeat the alphabet and the lion would just roar in the guy's face and with each roar it's as if you are not seeing <clears throat> what I am that's the greatest ability in nature. That was, for me, it, it's like, I'm telling you, there's, uh, we have a sort of comparative mind as an individual. Everybody does. That means you are actually externally, you may appear to have an individual body that's ev evident, evident uh, sensory-wise uh, through perception. But when it comes to actually who you are, you may even communicate yourself as, as an individual, you know, but I am telling you who you are behind your eyes is various ways your mind has sculpted itself in known ways from the unknown moment, you know, and so it's, um, Uh, excuse me, guys. Uh, pretty much what I'm saying is that just like how trees have their roots in invisible, uh, in, 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 in a soil that we cannot see unless we go and move the soil and follow the roots of the tree, the human being seems to have uh, the roots of its consciousness in an invisible soil, just like how we can't see the roots of the tree, the roots of the mind seem to be, and my mind, Mr. Within's suggestion for now, is that it's like a field. That means we individual consciousness is rooted in a collective consciousness that is attributeless because the soil is different than the outside of the soil. You see, once man uh, has confronted the multidimensionality of his inner realms, that's just the beginning. Then, then it becomes fascinating to see the multidimensionality of the outer realm. What does that mean? That means you found a way to perceive your subjective self's individuality, and then you manage the way to perceive the objective self's individuality. Then you're going to perceive the... Uh, subjective uh, 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 the subjective self's collectivity you the multi-dimensionality of it it's like a pattern I wish I could draw it like a here like the symbol would be like two capitalized Y letters connected at the end Right, so each each point of that line has like two pathways, the known and the unknown. Pretty much, this be, this becoming acquainted to the known and the unknown is the ultimatum of knowledge. 
it's it's not a situation where one can just believe and that's it for life it's a participatory uh, process that's what I realized you know Oh, okay <laughs> so um, guys I'll be honest I'll, I'll tell you guys an interesting story because it's being brought up in the chat section um, in 2012-13 you know <laughs> guys it's cool it's cool I want to share with you this story because I had a friend his name was Gabriel and um, this was years ago, then something happened, my inner realms kind of, it was like I, I had to disconnect. But it was, um, I had this friend who I was like in this kind of roomy, like happiness, <laughs> roomy metaphysical happiness, you know, you know, and he was, he was, um, he was Romanian and he had this sort of constant conspiracy mindset. And I remember there would be moments where he would be explaining these uh, conspiracy things to me. And I would tell him at the end of it, why do you see, uh, why, uh, why see an enemy, uh, why, uh, why consider an enemy behind a door you can't see? I would tell him that. And what that means is that this is life. There are certain things that are in one's control and there are certain things that are not. I cannot choose, I cannot choose, for example... Uh, the earth to rotate the other way, but I can choose to turn my head for example, you know So that means this plane of existence is not a promise of full control and those who seek full control They mutate out of the collective nature That means if you any person who's too viciously taking and not aware what's happening to the environment It's like they are creating. It's like how can I tell you it's strange uh, any any violence done in this lifetime, uh, it, it's as if like uh, in whatever you hit in your external realms, your inner realms will re reflect, you know. <clears throat> so my mentality is that uh, this is life. We are every person is a unique DNA. We are kind of like opening our eyes to an incredibly advanced system. I you, this concept of conspiracy can even be taken to a galactic le level we haven't even opened up as a civilization to galactic archetypes what if the whole universe is the conspiracy of some galactic government you know and what if that galactic go government is under the conspiracy so you see there is there is various ways that the mind can link the world but it must choose to walk the pa a path that it trusts or it, its full intelligence won't activate you know so what I mean by that is you got to you got to treat language as symbols hovering in space just like atoms. And if you don't then history solidifies around them and then beliefs take form. You know, so you can say a concept is fighting for the same space where your freedom and free will is fighting for. You know, and various concepts can come and structure in the mind. You know? So I I'm, I'm telling you it's like no no or group on this planet can own the nature of the cosmos. They cannot own it in interpretation. And even though I speak about it, do you know the poet Rumi has said so wonderfully? He says silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. What does that mean? That means as long as our pure intentions and motivations for the world are still in a narrative, are still in a sort of... Um, uh, story modality then it's I'm telling you it's like that's when you you've you've put on virtual reality headsets and your afterlife is going to be the game you program now you know and that's p uh, playfully saying that I'm playfully I'm saying that you know I find that at the end at the end of all belief systems there is an attention just watching at the end of all roads there is just an awareness that saw the self happen and so I notice that the moment I consider external factors too overwhelming for me to engage, that's when I have given up on, on my external reality. When my inner realms feel as if there is nothing. 
You know, there was there was a moment in a, a, a few. I, I could say it's getting close to like a year ago, where I experienced a sort of uh, inner death, and it was throughout the day. Some some intense chaotic thing had happened, and it, in my inner realms, it had shaken it. You know, it had shaken my inner realms, and that 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 doesn't tend to happen to me. Since 2000, especially since 2014, my inner realms don't get shaken by external language that much, you know. But the external th phenomenology that was happening in that moment, literally what was happening in that moment had shaken me. And I'll never forget it. It was a moment where I had this um, um, kind of like I had this ring and I don't know, the, it, 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 like how can I tell you? I felt... My realities, I felt the world was going to stop. I literally felt my inner realms were going to stop. And it was a moment where I'm telling you, it was like this wind. This wind pushed me and every idea that I had ever had, it was as if I suddenly saw the empty handedness of our attention, you know, when the time comes. So I am telling you, that we are coloring in the world, coloring the world in with conception. And before we were born, there were those who colored it in with conception. But the, the, the utility of it is the attention beyond. And once you realize how much of your life, is, the values of it are internal and external, it will fascinate you. It will fascinate you. Sometimes you see, you, if, you, if, if you separate the subjective and objective realm and are conscious of it, you notice you know, you can notice someone who's not conscious of their inner realms because they feel what they see is the only thing. Do you know? This doesn't mean the person can't have an opinion. It just means that there are more rooms, you know? And so we have to climb. I remember putting this analogy like, <clears throat> what do you call it? Like meteors hitting earth, making a hole inside the earth. And that's the human being, how the human being is starting, where you have to climb out of the whole of your inner realms that your conditioning made for you as a human being. And then, and then you get to see. So for me, I'm telling you, it's not some super happiness uh, beyond the veil as if like, all right, free ticket to heaven. No, it, it's there, there is no free ticket to heaven. Earth is in heaven. Heaven is just, it, it, it's like, it's kind of like when you can see it, you'll see it. And it's not a, a location. It is how the state of mind is being local to itself in the void. And it's endless. There are certain observations that are eternity's way of joking, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> you see, it's, it's just this. It's like, if you make the life serious... You're living in, your state of mind is like a solid state. It's like ice. Literally, like the, like the substance is in, in, in a solid state. So what does that mean? That means pure materialism. Right now, I can start rejecting every effort of every human being and be like, no, I don't believe even in history. I just believe what I can see with my eyes. And what I can see in my eyes is this room I choose not to go out of, you know? So I can totally choose to feel that the whole world is this room I'm in. You see, but the effort, the effort of the scholars and philosophers was that they were, they, it, does, it doesn't mean there's something very, a beautiful dimension of philosophy that has been missed. That means it hasn't, it, it, the culture has been ignorant to it. And it is the, I call it the struggle, the struggle of the str explorer, the inner, the inner sacrifice of the explorer. That it's as if the mind sees that uh, what is worth it in the moment. What is worth, worth it in the moment? I remember giving a talk and the talk was like, who are you living for? In other words, where, where is your attention? What is being your attention? And if nobody has your DNA, that's another way of saying nobody is your teacher. You know, nobody can teach you what you only see. Do you see what I mean? That's why this is the thing where it's like, that's why I think it's like uh, most of my work is kind of done for me because the species has, has an awareness to language. 
Do you know? So I'm happy, like at least my eyes opened in a, in a time where language has been established. We've had certain uh, great uh, continental philosophers, you know? Language is the most fascinating thing. If you want uh, to create a genius civilization, make them conscious that they are observers of the subject. They are not the subject. And you can choose to be the subject in certain moments, but isn't it, isn't it the case that, like, <clears throat> Rumi gave this metaphor. He's like, if you make your hand into a fist, literally, like, make your right hand into a fist and keep it there intense, the, the muscles go into a sort of fatigue and it's like there's a paralysis. And if you stretch out your hand, you stretch out your fingers as much as possible, you know, you suddenly see the hand will still get paralyzed. So belief systems are unnecessary intensific static in, uh, uh, in, in, intensifications towards a static image, but the system is dynamic. I am saying that we are believing if there, it's like civilization currently is like wondering, should we believe in a horse or should we not believe in horse riding? And Mr. Within is saying, ride the horse, ride the horse. It's happening now. Every day happens once. That's it. The show has begun, you know? You are an actor of a manifest cosmos. What, what, what grander title do you need? For me, guys, there was something that I found my nature teach me because I have a unique relationship with geometry. And it was, it was a relationship that experientially made me not care for any sort of connotation I had for geometry till that point. When I realized it's an expression, it's a language. You know, I'm that guy in history that's saying geometry is a language. And also, <laughs> uh, let's say you heard it from Mr. Within. The, uh, the, the next great language of all languages is geometric. Geometry is the crystallization of the symbolic attribution uh, to a system oscillating between uh, light and sound and their absences. Because it's moving, right? Like right now I'm speaking to you, I seem like a living human being to you because I'm animate, I'm speaking. The energy, the, the, it, there's a freedom of observance that moves, you know, because when I was trying to articulate free will, you know, I mean, conceptually, on a subjective sense, it's easy to say, yeah, we got free will. But when you look at the mechanics, <coughs> you know, you will inevitably see that what uh, the, the self the concept of the self and the concept of the world are moments of generation. The mind is not just generating a sense of self. The mind is becoming the different worlds that that self can experience. And so the mind is another way of saying that you can take reality and the copy-paste version of it, which is the subjective symbolic existence of the object, uh, that can be incredibly, it's incredibly malleable. That means sometimes it's like a person, a child can play with Lego and so a human being can play with conception because ultimately language within every word there is the image of a world. Or tends to be, you know. Of course, some, some words, pretty much I consider when you look at definitions in the dictionary, this is it. Some, some are pointing to the known or unknown. So pretty much all the questions, it's like humanity asked truth, and it was as if one answer was like, yeah, it can be known. It's this, this is truth. And somebody said, no, we can, you, there's, you can't know truth. You're too temporary to know the truth of this whole big, huge, like billion trillion uh, star universe. And it doesn't mean we can't have an opinion again. It, it, it just means that if we want a specific extraction of an outcome from a changing, unknown, and vast system, we are the fools of our own uh, 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 paradisal efforts, you know?
Yeah. So, 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 guys, there um, in in the chat section. Um, yeah, it's about witnessing. It's like we've been schooled and conditioned to constantly think of ourselves as objects. And we're trying to live a subjective reality like an object. But the subjective realm changes way, way quicker throughout the days. Just wonder how many different viewpoints you had. You know, how many different angles of the same earth you had. Every day I wake up, it's like, okay, another day walking on a rock in the middle of nowhere trying to figure out what all this means. You know, because there is something about language that it's a truth. I don't want to say it's a truth. It's a... Uh, it's like, it's as much of a truth as a hole of a sinking ship where water is coming out of the hole. It's as much of a truth like that. That language is um, being administered by not the particle in the field, but the field is moving the particle. So man... It's just, it's like, for me, I found it very, like, very playfully in my mind, in my, how can I say it, like, years ago when I was thinking about the gods, and I was thinking about the different forces, you know, scientific forces, uh, what is it, it's like, um, what are the four major forces, uh, how do I forget this, weak nuclear, uh, oh. <laughs> Guys, hold on, I gotta check something. Okay, guys, here. I found a... Um... <clears throat> Much better way to share this. Pretty much uh, what I was saying was that pretty much I, I, I saw parallels in the archetypes I had held for gods and the way I, my mind and attention uh, had accepted the classification of the universe. So what does that mean? That means the intelligence that is classifying, imagine in ancient Greek times, different gods is the same intelligence now currently classifying different forces of the universe, you know. And so, what are these four forces here? We're, there we go. There we go. Gravity, uh, electromagnetism, those I remembered. The weak force, the strong force. There we go. Okay. And so, in scientific circles, this is considered as these are the four forces uh, of nature. They govern. They seem to be governing for now uh, how uh, the how stuff happens in the universe. You know, gravitation, very obvious. You don't need to see it. Electromagnetism, very obvious. I think the weak force and the strong force may be implying a macrocosmic and microcosmic uh, analysis. So I won't get into those two to avoid um, inaccuracy. Okay, here, the weak force, also called the weak nuclear interaction, is responsible for particle decay. Ah, okay, yeah, so this is like the life and death. I could totally see the life and death of... Uh, of a star is being considered as various forces acting. Oh, oh okay, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, anyways, uh, a a, ma a vast archetypal game that is uh, sculpting clay into forms that we can acknowledge to build upon. You know, it's like. A person wants to um, <clears throat> build a roof, they require to build pillars first, you know? And if one wants to build, how can, how can I say it? Um, an archetypal stance that is valid multidimensionally, it means that automatically the observer is the most, is the source of the multidimensionality. It's like one light, it's like the Pink Floyd album cover. And the white light that goes into the prism and all the colors of the prism that emerge out from the other side, you know, the color spectrum, it's as if the white light is the observer within and the color spectrum is all the ways that the world has become and moves. So, 
we must advance inner technologies language and the awareness to language will shift and I think the main focus is creating enough just enough that means if we can make uh, a sort of you see what is it it's like all all of life is actually game development every person their articulation of how to even uh, function in the world is actually how to be a player in a game of your own perception and also in the perception of others especially for example a person who's a president of a, of a nation they are in a in, in an important game they are in a game that they they must be open to 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 any sort of communication do you know that means uh for now human beings are running around the earth trying to live out their days and emotional stability is the point that means right now if somebody says what is more important you know <clears throat> we find intellect uh, we we make the accuracy and intellectual truth more precise we, we look after truth or do we just attend to the species you know what that means that means all all that wonder and fascination of the universe and philosophy and satisfies uh the wonder, the wonder of the mysteries of the cosmos must, must be pushed aside if we are to look at human beings who have built a society where as a character you don't just go on rational ideas throughout the day, you know? I find what it is is like the attention is like uh, a camera and the camera is on and the world is moving and sometimes the camera can move in the world, you know? And what is looking out through the camera is not an individual soul. It's not like, you know, Casper or something. You know, it, it, it is a field. I am, I am saying that beyond the conception that hovers behind our, uh, uh, beyond the conception that hovers behind our eyes, uh, we are rhythm. We are cosmic rhythm. We have, we have for now established intelligence as, for example, uh, uh, th uh, through a particular way, you know, through, through the notion of uh, complex structures of, uh, 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 and, and modes of particles emerging, do you know? So what does that mean? That means simple stuff is behaving complexly and it is behaving so complexly that it has suddenly found a simple witnessing awareness to all this complexity now this simple witness and complexity to all uh, uh, how can i tell you it's like uh get to know your attention it's it's the privilege of a lifetime it's the blessing of a lifetime I, I think it's the superior joy i think that's what billionaires are looking for a mind that uh is unburdened and unburdened doesn't mean inaction. You know, it doesn't mean that uh, because the world is an illusion, stop living in it. It doesn't mean that. It just means that the moment changes. Nature moves upon itself, within itself. <clears throat> and it's like the story. It's the story of this, uh, this group of young educated fish. And all these young educated fish... They're trying to figure out what is this God. And God to them is actually the ocean, but they, they can't acknowledge it. Literally, they can't see it because they're in it, you know? And so the, these fish go to a silent, older, sage-like, you know, fish, you know, that is, uh, you know, sitting on the mountain of a coral reef. The old, younger, uh, educated fish go to this older fish and they're like, older fish, you know, I'm, I don't know if there's a sage fish, but like this would be one problem. <laughs> and so they ask this fish, what is God? What is this truth that everyone's wondering about? And the fish says, it's everywhere, man. It's everywhere. It is within everything. The currents of this 
are keeping you. And what does that mean? That means the truths of matter are rooted in unspeakable space. Dark energy and dark matter is another way of saying it's too dark to see the edge of existence consciously. Because on some level I thought how ridiculous that if one chooses a materialistic perception only, then it's as if it, life is valid with having no no direction. It's as if you're, you're speed without a direction. You know, it's a de-evolution from a velocity of conscious living. The mind is strange, but like, it's like throwing rocks. This is at least my experience. When I speak, it's like throwing a rock in a pond. And the pond is unknown and the rock is known. And when I throw this rock in the pond, there is an effect to it, you know, and this effect somehow has a sort of subjective appearance for me. That means it's, it's like I, I am not thinking in language when I speak to you, actually. It's as if like there is an image and then there's the, like, like a river of images. And then this from this river of images, I have put my hand in this river of images and whatever droplets are coming onto my hand, it's like those are the words I'm throwing out in this talk. You know, so what, what does that mean? That means that there's a way that we can be aware of ourselves, which is at a speed that duality becomes so instantaneous that it's like imagine cause and effect being instantaneous. A dimension where things are only being born and a dimension where things are only dying and the human being is oscillating, is flying between these two. And how, how your attention moves is the key because that is the only game of consciousness left. We have mastered the objective realm to the degree of acknowledging it. All right, we've made stuff. You know, there's manufacturing companies. We've got, uh, there's consumerism. It's like there is uh, objective mastery to some degree. Now the human being has also attained certain subjective mastery. That subjective mastery is how you are seeing yourself as a person. And you may think, you may be a person right now alive and think, that there are, there's, a, there's a hierarchy and your intelligence is on some spectrum of it. But let me tell you, you are a genius if, you're, if the caveman was looking at you. <laughs> Do you know? Um, yes, Andre, the, the superposition you speak about, I feel that that's, that's equivalent to what I was saying about the instantaneity of the cause and effect, you know, it's when the microcosm and the macrocosm are occurring so simultaneously that we can't separate them. So suddenly it, it's like realizing, uh, the light in your eyes and the energy that is conscious of itself are indis indistinguishable. They, they, are, they are instant. And when one gets to the state of instant, like an instant consciousness, I would say, you know what that means? That means the eon training cycle of awareness, being awareness and then being self and being awareness and being self. It's like that stabilizes the concept of self-awareness becomes an experiential, collective experiential rhythm. I'm telling you, it's like the next thing, teach, the, the future teachers of the world will be multidimensional surfers. And when I say surfers, not like surfing the web, surfing on like waves. History is a wave. Your, your identity is your, 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 your vision is your surfboard. And so ride the wave. What else can you do? You know? You know, some, there has been times where uh, I have totally, like, like I, I remember when I was in the UK and uh, I, uh, I had kind of um, messed up my financial system. You know? <laughs> and I went three days without eating. And when you don't eat, what happens is like the body temperature goes down. So you get cold quick, right? And I remember it, it reached a point where I was trying my last option which was uh, 
uh, I, 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 how can I tell you I was requesting you know assistance from family member at that point and it was like the, as I was waiting there was my body went into a shock and let me tell you what I mean by that that means it's like life we can't say a person is alive you know if they are not conscious of life and that's it, it's very it's a bit sad it doesn't mean there isn't potential for consciousness, but it just means that you have to be able to see yourself as something to be able to, how can I tell you, for the plane to be accessible. It's kind of funny. Um, you want to, you, 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 the external realm, you navigate as an individual self. The internal realm, you navigate as a collective world. <clears throat> that's the thing it's 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 believe it or not all of knowledge can come it comes down to geometry it comes down to design acknowledgement how we're acknowledging design and really you look at human beings in different there was a time where i was intim intimidated by philosophers and history and there's a, when in my youth like how can i tell you like i was how how, how would i say it There came a moment where I was like, when I looked at the contributions of Ludwig Wittgenstein, when I looked at the contributions of Heidegger, you know, Hegel, <clears throat> Descartes, it was, it was, it was for me. Imagine, it's like any time you feel behind <laughs> from the past, it's like. <laughs> It's like when you read something from a philosopher in the past and you see they were seeing so ahead of their time, you know, it just makes you kind of like close your notebook of thoughts in the moment and be like, gosh, the unknown astonishes me again, you know? <laughs> you can say, guys, um, that concepts are recycled through the, the efforts of personalities to uh, bring those concepts uh, to the collective. You see, I, I remember giving a talk. It was called Hunter Gathers of the Inner Realms. I was saying that there is this need for a multidimensional renaissance, and it's pretty much going to happen because there's no other option. <laughs> like literally, and I'm not even saying that. I feel it's like, it's like, if, it's like a seed planted before any of us were alive, you know? The design, the design of civilization will be advancement. Pretty much, this creature, its intelligence has been set up in a hierarchical way, so that epitome of the hierarchy is always the new. So it's seeking to do constantly new things. It will eventually reach a point where it will see the new is endless. That the mind can endlessly read the same book and have different images animate in different parts of it. You know. It's the same with concepts, and it's even the same with the concept of self. Like, your sense of self is as multidimensional as you've experienced different uh, evocations of it. You know, how in different rooms you have been different people by the nature of the room. It's like sometimes a person's voice, if they're not conscious of, if they're not comfortable with the, their own unknown eyes, they will quickly, they will quickly bunker in the, in, in the knowledge of others. What, what takes strength is not to, not, it's like that being is not uh, uh, intellectually superior, I find, who, who says this is it. It's the one who can stand, stand in the battlefields of the unknown. That means still, it's like the, the, explorer, the, the explorer's inspiration of your inner child doesn't die, and that's how your full intelligence is still accessible. You have, to, you have to return to a moment of life where you still had control over uh, your attention. I'll give you an example. For example, in my youth, um, I was very quiet. Extremely quiet. And not extremely quiet, but it was as if like there was no thought in my mind that the moment needed to have a purpose. And it was just, like, it was just energetic being, you know? I don't know what it was later on. I heard the story, but it was like, it was like a family. It was like one of my aunts or something that when I was super young, 
you know, what had happened is I have a twin brother. And uh, when I was like five years old, there's my, my mother told me there was this story that my twin brother was being hit by um, a distant, like, how can I say it? Like, I, like, we were five. I don't have any memory of this, but it was told to me. So, like, <laughs> this, is, this is a good kind of thing to say for all those people interested in twin psychology, you know. Um, so, uh, pretty much, I, I was told the story of my own, something that happened in my youth, that when I was, like, five years old in a party, uh, this girl hit my brother. You know, and at that age, I ran from across the room and I pushed that girl, you know, and this is a five-year-old me. And then my aunt comes and scolds me, you know, just this, this it's strict scolding. I have no conscious memory of it, but it was like, then my mother comes and looks at my aunt with, with the strict scolding and like shouts at my aunt, what are you doing, you know? But it was like, and I, I, I heard the story later on, but there was something, and I'm not, I'm not blaming that incident. It could have even been a totally different incident, but there was something that had made me distrust my own self in the world. And when I realized that was all a linguistic simulation, this kind of linguistic painting that was so close to my face, I couldn't see anything else. That was when it was, I, I, I believe it or not, put down all archetypes I have ever held. And it was for the first time, it was as if I was giving back all my inner realms to the unknown. And that moment of releasing your identification with certain subjects that you have held, with, held on to your whole life, there was just a simplicity. And once you, it's like cycles, guys, it's like the once the simulation of the inner uh, desire, the, the, uh, the archetypal inner self that one has still external desire, once that simulation finishes, then the collective mind of the civilization begins moving the individual consciousness. What does that mean? That means playfully think about it, that we consider, oh man, future, our future is going to be super advanced technologically. They're going to do things we can't, like time travel, da 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 but, but for a second, if we think about it, that the future evolution of our civilization is towards an inconceivable and attributeless. We're literally a particle evolving into a field. You know, at that point, it would be as if our future self is everything, but our, our, our past self was just a grain of sand, in, you know, a grain of stardust, innocent stardust. <laughs> I sh I'm definitely going to write a, po a poetry collection and call it innocent stardust, you know. <laughs> And honestly, when I look at this cat's face, I see nothing but the innocence of the range of awareness it has. And I think cruelty is when a human being is not aware how another person's eyes is functioning uh, with a certain pace. It's like it's all driving. We're all driving. Uh, uh, it's like archetypes are being driven through speech in, in stories and in various uh, storylines, you know? <laughs> and really, it's like, when I look at this cat, I'm like, what's the purpose of the life of this cat? You know, does this cat need to build an advanced civilization? Does this cat need to get rid of its sins? Does this cat need to go to heaven? Does this cat, you know, uh, need to work hard to survive? I see no. It's nature being nature, and its direction is still free flow. That means the environment, the eco environment is the imagination of the cat, but human beings, they are their, their own imagination. You know, we are the, the attention moves it. So I feel we have to start treating our minds like advanced instruments that we have been, uh, 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 not caring for, and once you care, they'll get the gates open. I remember I was in a situation 
that I had to convince someone uh, to do something for me in regards to uh, I'm trying to remember the, what the context was. Pretty much I needed someone's help with a project and <clears throat> that person didn't care. Simply they didn't care. It was, it was as if it was not real to them. And there was a moment where I realized I had to communicate the importance of why my attention was moving that way. We are evolving into a remembrance that we were a field prior to languages, linearity, and uh, categorization of the realm. For me, playfully, like every person will find their own pace and what that means is they will find some sort of outlook over time that they can work with, you know? And for me, that, that framework, the archetype that I, when I started giving these talks or, or how can I say it, just like pretty much my whole life has felt like one profession. And that is that I have been piloting my plane of existence with my attention. And I have been pilot, piloting it in self-contained time, self-conceived time, in all. As if I've had moments where there's an emptiness of the outer realms, which is a bit startling. It's a bit, so, a bit alarming. Like kind of seeing, uh, seeing the planet in outer space and being like, whoa, is that pitch black uh, three-dimensional space everywhere? <laughs> You know, so outer space has a sort of kind of reaction in the person, can lead to a sort of response in the person. But the hollowness of the inner realm, that's chaos. You know, this is why um, you have to find a world uh, that you can accept to engage. You know, that means pretty much, let me tell you, it's a free-for-all. There is no, uh, imagine... <clears throat> All the hierarchies of knowledge, power, uh, and just various systems that were creating certain conditions, structured conditions for man. Imagine they all collapsed. Then what state, what, how would we define a sort of order to anarchy? Because if order and chaos are seen as dimensional takeaways of the moment, so that means even emptiness can ha be chaotic or it can be a sign of great order. For the Zen mind, emptiness is revelatory uh, uh, truth. But for example, let's say a secular mind or a sort of hedonistic perspective, you know, emptiness is like, what the fuck? Things are going to just stop existing? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> So we have, we have to, uh, I find that I'm just sharing that it's, it's like language comes and goes. La, Chang Su, the Zen master, spoke about them as if they're leaves of a tree. It, it's like they change as the seasons pass. So what does that mean? That means all the beliefs of yesterday are on the ground. <laughs> and the beliefs of tomorrow are blossoming, you know. And so this is why that's the belief game. That's the game of... Uh, you telling the world what to do rather than the world telling you what to do. This this is the humility, and this is something that I, I admired in, 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 in uh, how can I tell you, stretching from the fathers of science, whether it was Isaac Newton or Galileo, where they cared enough to see something else. They cared enough to wonder about a different framework to how the axis of the whole cosmos is kept. That was... That was, that was, that's, that's inspiring. You know, for me, a, a person in a gym, you know, I mean, I could totally understand. There was a time I would see a lot of these gym videos where it's like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger just like raising barbells, shouting, ah, you know, and I was like, yeah, I'm getting pumped. Yeah, I'm inspired, hard work. And then I realized hard work, you know, uh, excuse me, but donkeys work hard too. You know, it's not, it's not about just your body working hard, but it's about what this mind that you have, you know, can, is giving you access. 
So you see, an inner luxury could be said to be knowing more about your world. An outer luxury would can be said to be having more access to what can be known. You know. You know, there's the story of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, here's there's this philosopher named Diogenes. And Diogenes, he is technically in, in philosophical circles, he's acknowledged as the father of cynicism. But you can say he was the first rebel of the inner realms, one of the early rebels of the inner realms acknowledged in history, you know? That means I can tell you that I probably think Diogenes could have been more far-sighted, more of more had more deeper vision than even Plato. But Plato had more uh, complexity to, to share with the civilization, not more complexity, but like you see. Uh, anyways, I, I'm. I'm uh, <laughs> where was I going with this? Oh yeah, Alexander Great. So Alexander Great with his army, he, he's like, all right. You know what's cool, Andre? The world is a, is shape shifting all the time. You know, the the on a very mi micro level. You know, at, it's like it, it, potential energy is becoming kinetic. Kinetic energy has a potential. You know, the loop goes on. But anyways, Alexander Great suddenly finds himself. You know, he's walking like you know. Like he not, doesn't own the neighborhood, he owns the kingdom. <laughs> you know? You know, it's like the way Napoleon walked and the way a billionaire walks today, not no way comparable. You know? The kingdom for Napoleon was his living room. You know? <laughs> the empire. But anyways, Alexander the Great suddenly Diogenes is getting he's just lying on like grass getting a tan it's like you know it's like he pretty much didn't do much Diogenes so <laughs> so he's lying lying there on the grassland and the sun is hitting him you know and he's getting he's just basking in the sun you know uh, suddenly a shadow comes and Diogenes has already had footsteps of soldiers and so Diogenes knows what's going on. You know, he knows that it's like, why would all these soldiers be moving? It must be someone important, you know? And so Alexander Great comes, comes to suddenly is, is like, suddenly this shadow is cast on Diogenes where he's lying down and it's Alexander the Great. And uh, Alexander the Great, you know, the way he is, it's as if there, when, when Diogenes looks at Alexander the Great, his head, he sees Alexander the Great's face is not to the sun. So he can see Alexander the Great's ignorance. So Diogenes, uh, uh, Alexander the Great is, so comes and blocks Diogenes, the, the son that's hitting Diogenes, and Diogenes is looking at Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great says, uh, what does the great Diogenes want from the great Alexander? And, <laughs> Oh man, I wanted to say something. Okay, Diogenes says, "Get the fuck out of here, kid." <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, that was that was too rough. Um, Diogenes says, "Don't block my son," and he his head suddenly goes back on the grassland as if his attention is no longer on Alexander. And Alexander Great just it sinks in for a moment. <laughs> It sinks in for a moment, and Alexander Great suddenly. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm, my own humor is interrupting my own talk. <laughs> uh, Alexander the Great realizes what Diogenes is saying is that there's a hidden dimension of meaning to his quote, and what he's saying is, "Don't impose on my freedom, even though you are the conqueror of the realm." And so Alexander Great realizes this. You know? <laughs> Alexander Great realizes this. 
You know, he's like, holy shit, I'm nothing, man. <laughs> Alexander Great, he realizes this and he looks at his he looks at his army and he's a grand conqueror, imagine. You know, so he's the highest, he's he can say he is living uh at the highest archetype, uh the strongest archetype of the land, you know, in the site in the strongest archetypal position, the throne, you know. And so um uh, Alexander Great looks at his army and he, he suddenly realizes as if Diogenes has gifted him with insight and, and he says, Alexander Great says, <laughs> uh, if I wasn't Ale the, Alexander, the great Alexander, I would be the great Diogenes. I would be Di if I wasn't Alexander the Great, I would be Diogenes the Great. He's telling you like he's pretty much looking at his homeboys and he's like, holy shit, you know, this guy just says some next level. <laughs> But check out what Diogenes says. Diogenes says, if I was not Diogenes, I would still be Diogenes. And it's as if he's saying my temporary um, uh, appearance is in the presence of my eternalhood. You know, something like that. I mean, that can be extracted from that. You know, stories are, uh, they're like three-dimensional phenomena. You can, uh, uh, in some sense, the imagery of it can be observed or accessed in different ways. I need a drink. I need to a drink. Uh, I need a quick intermission, guys. I'll be back. I would like to, um, I got a feeling to read a poem I wrote, uh, a kind of, in, from, in 2015, 16, I wrote a lot of kind of like mystical existential poetry. And for some reason, I had a feeling right now to read um, one for you, and it's the 13th poem. I'm, I'm going to say this because these kind of talks are also like a journal for myself. Um, the poetry collection is called Endless Roads, written in uh, 2000, I think I started in 2015, and then it became the new year. So it was like written in 15, uh, finished in 16, you know. The only manifest glow. Give your light to all you can see. Give your light to all you can see, just like the center of the only manifest glow. Love is wise, for finding fault is the work of the past. 
the serenity of reality is a calculation beyond dominion the ego <clears throat> excuse me the ego is a net that must be torn or thrown away but by clarity's hand honesty does not lie to other or self what is freedom and beyond form oh sorry what is free and beyond form if you know the moment changes love your whole w-h-o-l-e love your whole Guys, the poetry collection has 26 poems. Anybody who wants to shout out a number, I'll just read a random number of it if you want, you know. See this as a sort of poem tunnel <laughs> segment of the show, you know. You know, guys, I'll tell you something that is the most profound, ultimate wisdom that I feel every living being has underneath their face already known. On some level, there is nothing new for a collective being to see, you know. And so what that is, is that life and nature has a genius, natural inbuilt genius that the less you disturb it or touch it or try to do anything about it you can see it happen so i am telling you uh if your life if if your inner realms are too complex you will be in a labyrinth of your own conception till the for eons be careful be careful to realize the value, the way we can see, believe it or not, any sort of theosophical other, uh, other side is actually through the simplicity of man. We have to return to the simpler principles of our own existence to comprehend how our experience is happening in complex ways and any all language. That's what I'm saying, guys. I, for, I'm saying we are a species evolving beyond language worship, you know? So after telling you that, I'm going to read you my poetry. <laughs> I'm, going to write, I'm going to read for you language I wrote. You know, language is a technology, guys. I'm telling you, don't take it too seriously or um, it will be the caging of a titan unnecessarily. So anyways, let's, okay, so let's see. Chat section. So Andre, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> You think says 22, sure, I'll read that. And Andre says number three, all right. Let's see what these are. I'm telling you guys, the way I see life is I don't see myself as, it's like a pilot or a designer. These two archetypes is pretty much it. I don't put that much effort in others because all the others can fit into these two archetypal positions, you know? All right, let me see. But I'll tell you guys, number 26 of this poetry collection is my favorite. Yeah. Uh, all right, 22. Let's see what, what is it called. So the poetry collection is Endless Roads. Hopefully, I'll, I'll have time soon and I'll offload it for you guys. Um, anybody who wants to get more updates and pretty much the personal dimensions of various projects I'm working on, uh, I decided to create a community on Patreon and I'll be sharing a lot of uh, content there. It's just, there's a safety in Patreon that's just nice. So anybody who wants to join the School of Athens 2.0, um, you're welcome. Uh, you're welcome to. Uh, so 22, let's see, what is, what is that? Oh my God, it's so long, but it's probably worth it. Okay, so number 22, you think, 
which is the u your username, you know, so people know. <laughs> a curtained romance. So consider this, the book is called Endless Roads and in it there's a poem called A Curtained Romance. Let us begin with the clay that likes to play with air as temptation breaks the wine glass. Who has made you drink thought? The opening of reality is beyond tired eyes that feel materialistically tied up. As the wind blows, could angel feathers replace Icarus's desire to rise up unprepared? We all feel blessed when right and wrong are dodged like temporal bullets. For what is the difference between rugs and drugs but one letter? <laughs> the playful always walk first through the spirit world. But if you're really thirsty, a sprite will do. <laughs> As the moment frees itself from the demand of past stories, how does the future knowingly write the unwritten? I felt I was special, but then I noticed the sun in my eyes. Light belongs to no man. Perhaps that is why the eternity of creation likes to dance. The wisdom of disbelief is your own curtained romance. So that's number 22, guys. Let's see number three. <clears throat> Number three is called Joys of Thought. <clears throat> so, Andre, Andre, so this is poem three. Joys of Thought. That's number three. So in a book called Endless Roads, we're talking about the joys of thought. Once a thought took belief apart, how can the mirror break itself? As many truths change the nature of one view, my phone calls over. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that, guys. To continue, um, uh, all, right, all right, I'll read it again. Joys of thought. Once a thought took belief apart, how can the mirror break itself? As many truths change the nature of one view. As many truths change the nature of one view. What makes all communities present in one existential community? All roads are as endless as you are. How can joy be misplaced? There are no unlucky men when the universe is lucky. Guys, I want to take a pause here. The universe is luck lucky we're here, guys. <laughs> 
the universe is lucky, not us. You know? <laughs> All right, let's get, let's get back to the poem. There are no unlucky men when the universe is lucky. Give the greatest blessing to the self of selves. Beyond choice and thought, there is only God. Know yourself. And guys, the way I use the word God, you can say it's like another word for nature. Happening all at once. And we're happening within it. And if it was alive, it could be an observance of itself. You know? <laughs> so so that, is, that is the poem, Joys of Thought. And I don't know why right now I'm getting this feeling to just share some commentary on that concept. You see, guys, we are... In the external realm, you have to go towards your survival. Or how would I say it? Like, for me, the joy of thought is just realizing that the new is being generated for there being unknown gaps of deep sleep through my conscious waking state. <clears throat> Eventually, I find the person can get to, as the Ribu Gita says, the witness, the state of the fourth state of the witness, which is the observer of the waking state, the same observer of the waking state and the dream state and even deep sleep. Now, some people will say, how can you be conscious of deep sleep? Um... Let me tell you, it's, it's, like, it's like asking how can you be conscious on the other side of a portal, you know? <laughs> it's like you can't see beyond the portal. I can't, I can't say anything about it. But it, it's like uh, the mind is so advanced that it has mastered many ways of self-existence subjectively to itself. So it's, uh, anyways, that's, that's where different talk. But I, I think here's the thing. Your, your eyes open, you're a creature, it's, it's like imagine all the theories, imagine all the storylines, imagine uh, all the uh, endeavors and the shadows and the lights of society and civilization and history. All of these has been just to some degree uh, <laughs> animate action of creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere. I think the real world is beyond uh, an activity that is ascribed to being self-conceived because you won't trust the subjective realm. You won't, you won't trust your inner realm. This is why I realize it's like it's, there is no individual gain. All those people who feel that power has to be individually attained, you're missing out on the real power. You know That what if the world is alive at once? not in fragments. The direct experience, it's unknown. That means I, if, 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 what, what I'm saying pretty much is that truth is unknown. And knowledge is its own interpretation of the unknown. What does that mean? That means the mystery still stands and, and the scholars of the future generations definitely have something to run towards. <clears throat> My whole effort is, I think I, I've kind of made it a side note for myself to constantly speak about this concept I've developed, which I say it's civilization 2.0, you know. And I'm going to say, Mr. let's say, Mr. Within's Civilization 2.0, so other people can have their interpretations of what the next kind of, if the currently we're experiencing Civilization 1.0 is like, what 2.0 would be like. And so I, I how can I say it? It's like when I've kind of um, looked at this existential condition from different angles, I've kind of concluded it's kind of weird, isn't it? Even though we human beings uh, evolved from nature, but it seems like we're trying to escape it. And I wonder, look at this. What is this messed up situation we have on Earth? So like if Earth is a messed up situation, what is this messed up situation? Oh, guys, I'm getting excited. Hold on. <laughs>
All right, guys. Uh, hold on. I gotta write these notes for me because what I'm explaining here is um, is a series of events that I feel should be um, focused on, pretty much by future generations. So we have Civ 2.0, okay? Civilization 2.0. Civilization 1.0, I have to talk about it first before going to 2.0. Civilization 1.0 is now. So what do we find now? What we find now, I feel, is that the human being feels intelligent, but the world where it's occurring and the systems that it's functioning through doesn't feel intelligent. So it's as if the self is evolved, the world is not. That like literally when I, when I walk in the street and I look at our stores and I'm like, if there was an ex, like literally I feel our consciousness will be uh, the way civilization is right now. If there was some sort of galactic, unnecessary, inefficient intervention, there would be some sort of no awareness. People are literally like too busy um, um, uh, decorating their own inner realms in, in bunkers of comfort rather than actually seeing that it, who else can be responsible for, 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 civil, for civilization, you know? This is why rebellion without responsibility is just a uh, dead weight. It's, it's just the transformation of the burden into another burden, not into... A change. This is why I'm saying uh, without in, a, an inner shift, there's no point of how much you try to change the outer, you know. And the inner shift has to do with recognizing that independence is your free will. That means it's, it's as if Mr. Within is telling you, dear listener, did you know the same way, you know, you choose to, for example, like uh, comb your hair or dress, you are you implementing your free will. Right, so you have that same free will with ideological perspectives, with ideological patterns. After uh, uh, object worship, it was as if imagine this: imagine there's a chair, a bunch of people come to this chair back in the day, and they're like, "Holy shit, this chair is God!" You know, like sunlight is hitting the chair, and they're like, "This chair has to be God." They start worshiping this chair. Then the owner of the chair comes out. It's like, "What are you guys doing? Give back my chair!" You know, and they're like, don't take our God away. You know, but history takes God, the, t took the gods away. As Frederick Nietzsche shouted out when he saw it, well, that man killed, uh, God is dead and man killed him. In other words, our intellect surpassed uh, the way our imagination was having an intimate relationship with the unknown. That means it's like it's, there's lost technologies and found technologies. Do you know how many evolutionary technologies are lost because we left the eco natural ecosystem as a much more higher energy leveled creature into a much more lesser but more intellectually sophisticated creature. That means um, um, there is a strength that comes from the environment that by human beings going from the concrete, uh, going from the actual jungle to the concrete jungle disconnected. We disconnected uh, that intu intuitive connection with the field of nature, you know. <clears throat> and so what is it? Are people waiting in rooms of thought till, till life finishes? No. It's like it's a navigation. It's a piloting. You are the commander of your attention. And when you realize oh, your, your eyes are your eyes, that's a wonderful moment because that's when free will has found itself uh, smiling in the mirror. So anyways, the guy comes and says, give me back my chair. And they're like, don't take our God away. Those people shout. But what it was, was that what I'm saying here is that there was a time that we looked at an object and we were like, that object is truth, you know? And then we looked at what did we, after the objects were slapped out of our hand, what did we start worshiping after object? Subjects, language worship, revelation, various uh, language programs entered the mind of the human being, generating life purposes, generating narratives. You know, it was as if like history is a tree that grew, even though so many trees are giving their lives, you know, to kind of like for us to be able to maintain it. <clears throat> Pretty much history is how the eyes of human beings were open before yours were. So anyways, we moved on to language worship. Now, what, what startled me was that I realized this language worship is going on 
okay? And that's why there is violence and cruelty. That is why there is war. Because there is an ignorance of how the other person can see it and communication has not increased. That means pretty much there's two ways of bringing world peace. Either we become advanced communicators so that we can negotiate peacefulness or, or we, uh, from the beginning, get, get rid of the concept of the, uh, of the separation from one another. So that means there are people who enter a room and they assume they're already friends with everyone. You know? And there are some people who enter a room and they're strangers to that space. You know? That means their inner realm has not accepted the outer realm yet. Or they feel the outer realm needs to accept them first before they can accept their inner realm. Or, you know, various ways can be seen. <clears throat> so anyways, the reason I'm saying that we're worshipping language right now, because ultimately what it means is the language is going to be slapped out of our hands. And this is going to be hap happening evolutionary-wise when collective... Uh, when philosophers in the future are going to be like, holy shit, we're going to connect human beings' heads to computers, what would that mean about the individual identity of the human being? What would that mean about consciousness? It's like, that's the level of philosophy we should be now currently, but we're not there yet. You know why? Because we're still, uh, it's like you. It's like we bought Ikea, the world is like Ikea furniture, and we're, we're still fighting ab ab over how to read the instruction booklet rather than realizing that it's like what if some, what if the instruction booklet didn't exist and what if it was something that has to be just built like it didn't come with an instruction booklet you know imagine the 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 pack the manufacturer forgot to put the instruction booklet in there you know but usually for ikea the instruction bo booklet comes with the thing what do you call it with the connected like in a bag with the knots or whatever so Technically, if you don't have the instruction booklet, you don't have the knots. But uh, let's say not IKEA. <laughs> let's say some 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 manufacturing company just forgets to put the instruction booklet in some product that needs to be built. What can one do at that point? You have to attempt to build it yourself, and it's kind of like the greater uh, kind of vision that kind of is echoed um, in the works of certain modern writers. I think it was a concept in the book, The Superior Man. I haven't read the book, but I remember someone talk, hearing someone talk about it. And then um, there's Bushido, which is the Japanese kind of code of honor, where it's as if the, mass, the, the archetype for uh, the true gaze of man upon his world is not one where he fears. It's one where he realizes if the mind can be afraid, why can't the mind simultaneously be active in a totally different uh, linguistical behavior like program you know linguistical behavioral program so, so, so you see it's it's like you, you know chemists they studied the reaction of different chemicals you know and so it's as if the psychologist comes and is studying the reactions of different thoughts but is accessing a much more sophisticated field because when I say em emotional stability for now is more of a priority than intellectual uh, 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 precision in truth is because even if the if the scientist reads the meter and gets an accurate experimental result accurate like there's no doubt about the scientific experiment results that science scientist would still be required to bring back that scientific experiment experiment or result to to what to like um how would I say it? Uh, back to a tribe of human beings that, for entertainment, go watch imaginary movies. So do you see what I mean? That means civilization is not a place where only rational ideas exist. Irrational ideas can be evoked. And violence suddenly appearing to someone's inner realms, violence in the civilization, is another way of saying inefficiency is lo becoming louder than efficiency. That means the human being hasn't realized that we're on a rock in the med middle of nowhere. And even Fermi, in Fermi's paradox, Fermi's like, where are the aliens? So the whole universe is empty too. So human beings have only each other and we're temporary. So I feel overpopulation is a problem because we're limited to two-dimensional space. And actually, if we manage to build sky cities, the overpopulation wouldn't be a problem. Now, this is where I can begin to introduce the listener to Mr. Within's vision of civilization 2.0.
Civilization 2.0, in my right, like, how can I say it? In my approach, I've kind of, um, I've called it a yin yang civilization. I'll explain what I mean by that. But really, it has three phases. First phase, all technology and finances, you know, have to, oh man, how would I say it? Imagine we went through a behavioral renaissance as, as 8 billion human beings and we just cared for civilization. And we found a way to, uh, to speak one language and build this tower of uh, Babylon towards an interstellar uh, humanity. <clears throat> I feel this should be the plan. When we live on the surface of the earth, what tends to or what is evident to have occurred is that nationhood has occurred. That means diff groups, uh, give different tribes have began owning land and updating their infrastructure throughout time. These tribes have emerged as what? As various nations and the occupation of the land means that instead of seeing one earth that is an endless resource for all human beings, it has become a resource that people have, uh, have claimed. You know, it's as if, like, imagine an all-you-can-eat buffet and one person's covering, like, one, one of the foods and another person is on the other side of the buffet covering three of the foods. And he's like, you got to pay me if you want to eat these foods. And the other person's like, you got to pay me if you want to eat the chicken. You know, like, <laughs> so you see, you see, it's, 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 it's an owner, it's an arbitrary ownership of a resource that realistically, if we didn't own, would be endlessly accessible to everyone. Okay. So civilization 1.0, the phase one of it is trying to build sky cities and immediately, you know, lift off uh, somehow. It's another way of saying all infrastructure of civilization should become like a spaceship and or at best a sky city, which is we are living in the orbit of our planet. We're not living on our planet. And at that point, cars will be. Uh, the only the car companies that transform to, uh, you know, av aviatory kind of <laughs> methods, they they succeed. You know that means I'm telling you, cars are are going to be airplanes soon. You know, uh, there's like wheels are going to be a scene in history books. You know. <laughs> So phase one of Mr. Within Civilization 2.0, get the civilization into the sky. That means we have to immediately, the children, literally all the teachers in the world should go to their students and be like, how can we solve this problem? You know, And the moment we do imagine we successfully complete civilization, uh, phase one of Civilization 2.0. What does that mean? That means imagine, very, it doesn't mean we, nobody's allowed to come on earth. It just means that Earth has become a heavenly vacation spot and we're living in the sky. And check this out. This is where phase two comes in of civilization 2.0. Phase two is when we allow the Earth to heal poetically. We build, the, there's the saying that uh, Earth is, uh, um, bu um, build paradise on Earth, okay? Uh, or earth is built in paradise. You know, this idea was there. So this is a human beings by living in the orbit have gotten rid of their influence on the surface. Literally, we're like an unusual chemical on the skin of nature to some degree in regards to the consequences of our uh, subjective innovations. But I'm, but I'm saying, <clears throat> so civilization uh, phase one, we got into the, into the sky Phase one, get rid of the, not get rid of, uh, literally relocate human efficiency on the surface of the planet to the orbit. Phase two, begin planting seeds and turning Earth into a planet as if it hasn't been touched. That means 
<clears throat> the whole agenda, uh, I don't, I, let me say it like this, the whole vision, the whole outlook of civilization 2.0 is that humanity is going to live in the orbit and the earth is going to become again a natural paradise without human influence. This may take, for now, I've, I've projected 2,000 years we're going to be living in our orbit. Now, why civili part phase three, <laughs> phase three of civilization to 2.0 is what do we do now in the waiting time of 2,000 years? In this system, and check this out. Let me tell you why I propose we should move the whole civilization into the sky. Because technology is evolving and cyberspace culture is going to emerge. And how, excuse me, but how stupid would be, how inefficient would it be that we are using the resources of the earth to just uh, not even look at the earth and plug ourselves into virtual realities. So we can do that in the orbit. We can just do that in the orbit and let the earth heal. You know, and civilization 2.0 is the gift to the uh, human genera generations of human beings that will continue on. You know, um, uh, the comrades of eternity that will enter the temporal. You know, so uh, and something I gotta say, in uh, something needs to occur before that. I was kind of suge suggesting it, but here's the thing. <clears throat> all nations will at that point have to look at the concept of the United Nations and realize that if in one dimension we are at war, in another dimension we cannot be. In other words, nations will become sub-nations of a humanity. So guys, this is something I'm proud of because the way I saw the design was like this, right? So it's like this. Nations are claiming themselves as correct. What does that mean? All nations are like a classroom of kids and each kid in the classroom is claiming they know. It's like, I gotta say this, we're, we're like nothing looking at something and realizing it's going to become nothing, then it's going to become something. We are piloting between the known and the unknown. This concept is very crucial to keep in mind as, as a, a conscious being who's navigating through individualism. So anyways, um, nations realize they are sub-nations of a collective nation and that nation people would say what are they sub nations of and that global community that global humanity is unshaped and people would be like what do you mean all nations are sub nations of this collective this one nation that has no shape and mr within will say yeah because it's they it's as if so they have become sub nations of the advanced civilization do you see that means are we are aiming for a future so great it is in, it, it is inconceivable so it, the reason it is inconceivable it is endless inspiration to advance for the future generation so what does that mean that means all nations become sub nations of this collective nation which is the overall uh, implication of uh, human advancement and this is an advancement, and advanced civilization has advanced inner technologies and outer technologies. The way I say inner technologies, that means uh, we will be much more, like the way I'm speaking right now, literally is going to seem like pioneer-like, like the language that... Um,
everyone will seem a pioneer to someone thousand years ahead of them. Do you know what I mean? Like, history is like two sides of a coin. In one way, you see progress. In a, uh, uh, you see kinetic progress. In another way, you see kind of uh, just potential. And it's a balance between learning to appreciate the process and also the rewards that come from it. Usually mindfulness means that if you don't appreciate the process, you won't appreciate the fruits of the process. So if you don't like how you're living, you're not going to like whatever you perceive from reality. It's like an inner discontent, not an outer discontent. So... One can say in Civilization uh, 2.0, Phase 3, what are we going to do? And that's where I, I, uh, I kind of saw this idea that we're going to have the greatest sort of renaissance and we're going to actually plan of, that's what we're going to pretty much in our orbits, uh, in, in, in that 2,000 years, plan to see how we will, in some sense, become an interstellar civilization. And the psychology would be very profound because children, for the first time, are being requested by their, the advancement of their civilization. It's as if this, their civilization is roaring to them, now go explore the stars, you know? And so what does that mean? That means humanity was born on Earth, but perhaps may not, is not meant to die here, you know? But, but if, if we follow civilization 2.0, there would be a paradise like Earth in the, in the making, you know? So that I find that um, build sky cities, uh, water the earth, um, uh, uh, explore the stars. These would be the three phases. These state each statement would be something for that. You know, there's something beautiful about design that the acknowledgement of just form is a much more ancient knowing than the acknowledgement of the movement of form. And I remember there was this interview that I saw from this guy. Um, his name is Richard Parker, and he has this uh, epic YouTube channel called Buddha at the Gas Pump. And he, he was interviewing this um, guy named Almas. I don't remember the guy's name fully. And I, I think the, the, the interviewer's name is Richard Parker, but I could be wrong. I think it is. And, and then so, so the interviewer was inter interviewing this guy named Almas. And uh, Almas was this, uh, this man who had w w kind of fearlessly went towards science and uh, didn't, didn't have this kind of metaphysical approach and he he went to kind of use science to discover something then it, it appeared as if it was there was more unknown and so his attention got pulled away differently but when the interviewer asked him tell me about your history Almas looks at the guy uh, at, at the interviewer and says uh, um, there's three answers I can give you 
There is my individual history that from the moment I was born to the moment I pass away. There is my universal history. And then he says there is a part of me that doesn't have a history, doesn't have a form, shape, self to even be in time. You know? This is why our minds are timeless, but our body is found in time. You know? That means it's as if eternity was that philosophical speculation of what if wakefulness doesn't go away? What if we are always awake? Even if when we are dreaming, we're still awake. What if? What if that the core of that wakefulness is unchanging? Which is the inspiration of the word eternity. Because the time doesn't change. What's in, in the eternal simulation can, but the time doesn't change. Eternity is a concept beyond time. This is why Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. So in other words, time is the shadow of higher dimensions. And if I was to give my sense of Mr. Ruthen's kind of uh, uh, multidimensional <clears throat> perspective, let's, let's entertain the fourth dimension till science, scientifically. That means not, not esoterically, the fourth dimension. Let's consider the fourth dimension, scientists say it's time, okay? And then beyond that, you know, that's where I'm going to share my, you can say my, my interpretation on uh, what I feel is beyond the fourth dimension or what, how, what relationships are simultaneous with the fourth. So uh, three-dimensional three dimension, three space, Easy to acknowledge the third dimension. Now, fourth dimension, you can say, is the addition of time. What does that mean? That means you wake up and go to work, and then you wake up the next day and you go to the same place. The only thing separating those two moments, which are pretty much the same action but done twice, is time. So multidimensionality requires duality first. I say this. Um, but anyways... So the fourth dimension is time, the time, like you were, you were, it's like yesterday and today. You see, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of, uh, sort of uh, division, a sort of dividing and conquering of uh, meaning, you know. So <clears throat> we have time. We have time as the fourth dimension. Now, what is the fifth dimension? Okay. Let me see how I'd explained it before. The fifth dimension is, I can say, the individual consciousness that in the fourth dimension, in the scientific kind of still, it's still secular to this point. Uh, individual consciousness in the fourth dimension, right, literally right now, I, I would say the fifth dimension is the, obs is the observer is the unknown. So if, the, if we say to the to four dimensions, that's what knowledge is hovering in, the fifth dimension would be unknown intelligence holding knowledge. You know, so that's why time is the shadow of a higher dimension. Do you know? So it, because it's the witness. Now the witness, check this out, because we think we're an individual, objective, conscious being, the, the, the what is what what can potentially be any sort of different dimension than that it would literally mean that the, it's like this moment it's like in the fourth dimension uh, we are the, uh, we are this in the fifth dimension we're the opposite we are the potential opposite subjective opposite of this okay so what does that mean that means like it depends you know uh it's kind of like uh uh what you hold in front of the mirror reflects back to some degree. Uh, so what is the sixth dimension? The sixth dimension is the inconceivability of the world. The fifth dimension can be said to be the inconceivability of the self. And I'd, I'd kind of explained it in my other talks. I don't know if, if you listen to a few of these talks, I might, you might hear different ways I've explained it. On some level, I've also explained this model that I say all this plane of existence, um, in order to pilot in this plane of existence that we find our humanity in, uh, 
the conscious, the attention, the present attention in the moment needs to acknowledge the zero dimension, the one dimension, the two dimension, and the infinite dimension. Why do I not say the third dimension? Because after you have duality, uh, you can have infinity. Duality is the, uh, is the father of infinity. Okay? But uh, singularity is the mother of duality. And the zero dimension is simply the absence of truth or phenomenological value. So what, what I mean by this is you as a human being, if you're comfortable with space, which is the zero dimension, then you'll be comfortable with the stuff in the space, which is the singular dimension, the individual forms. Then you will notice a bunch of individuals. So then it would immediately, it's like the next step before like let's say the multidimensionality that theoretical physicists speak about like parallel realities for example that's let's say before that there's a sort of multidimensionality where it's like first it's the void and the singular that's like the first seed of a duality then there is this sort of uh, uh, singular with the dualistic so it's like what does that mean that means it's like Either it's a singular truth or a multidimensional truth, but before this a multidimensional perspective, it was like either there's nothing or something. So it's like first, it's, it's a relationship of something in space with stuff in space, you know, then it's a relationship of stuff in space with more stuff in space, you see, which is the singular dimension, uh, the one dimension confronting the dualistic. And this is where uh, the dualistic begins. That means... You cannot be a character in a story if there wasn't a world where there was before that world space for that world to be there. In other words, what I'm saying, guys, to kind of land this plane... We are creatures that are using language as the most advanced tool for expressing ourselves energetically. We are under the impression that we have to know what is going on in every moment. So it is making people anxiously and fearfully cower away in snapshots, snapshot photos, you know, of a film-like world. This world is alive and it's moving. Think about the complexity of your own intelligence as a human being. Look at how you're alive. Look at your hands and even notice the unique symmetry. You're like, whoa, what is this symmetry in the human body? You see, and so there is not only symmetry, but it's as if like uh, when you look at the body from the horizontal, let's say from left to right, you see symmetry. When you look at it vertically, you see a totally different uh, structure. So it's as if like there was a sort of symmetrical sculpting of, of the plane of existence horizontally. So it's as if imagine like two hands from the sides of a clay coming in very exactly symmetrically uh, sculpting it and then two hands differently shaking like the top and bottom part. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's like pretty much there is some value we perceive then we work with the value, you know. If the person has just this no notion that the best of your ability is all that life asks, really, and it's really all that you can give, I feel we should uh, become conscious that we are not thoughts and that we are projectors of identity. We are not the identity. Because literally, we, I, you are not who you were 10 years ago, but somehow you are consciously still that same being, you know? So it's as if being is an unconditional state, but doing things is conditional. So if one wants a state of being to occur by doing something, there's a very, there's like a 50-50 chance, you know? But if you're being something, you're already being it. Okay, so so um, Andre in the chat section, if you if you're saying it's the current, 
Um, that's what I'm saying. So this is where I have my own school of thought and people have their different schools of thought. I, I, the school of thought that I walk, the halls of the school of thought that I walk in is one where I consider that my soul doesn't have a personality ultimately. So this doesn't mean it's not intelligent. It just means it is not bound to one sphere of being. These abstract pillars that hold reality they are how a subjective life is inspiring an objective life and that subjective life the glory of the human evolutionary process is that now you have access now you have uh, you can uh, free will can there can be a freedom a sophistication of observance of the environment to a point where now free activity can occur in the environment <clears throat> and being aware of our activity is really our evolution so i can tell you that for me, it, it can be to some degree simply explained that how did the human being suddenly become super advanced is because it became aware of itself from another perspective. And a perspective that could watch nature separate to it. I, can, I, I, I call that the subjective evolution. And the subjective evolution means that we navigated the attention of intelligence uh, when it's like the world changed before the self, so ultimately whatever self you th you thought you had, it has become the new world. You know. There's something about this cat in the wallpaper that is like I feel like. This is the cat of an explorer. <laughs> really, uh, our purpose is driven by our eyes. By, and the, our eyes are driven by our attention. We're creatures of attention. We are not just uh, a body in the space. The, the, it's like we are self-awareness. We are simultaneity as the Vedic. Vedanta would say of Purusha and Prakriti, as, as the yogic minds would say. That means chaos and order are the wings of the same bird. And the mind requires it to some degree to exist. But the grand order of free will is that after the self has updated, you know, if the world hasn't, that self can't completely know itself as updated. So that means the the after you complete, uh, after you completely live, and in uh, for an for for yourself as an individual, then you'll see the, the joys of thought become the collective life of a civilization on a rock in the middle of nowhere. And that's the cool thing about uh, I I feel uh, the the continental philosophers of the world. That they were like, wait a minute, am I putting these symbols on these objects? Or are the objects actually these symbols? Because many people identify with their name, but how are you just the sound? How, how can you be letters on a page? It's like the intelligence is the self-awareness or the word life form or the word human being uh, pretty much this is how I feel the moment is it's designs and it's movement of attention as the whole moment that means your mind is actually being your whole moment and when when a human being for example hurts another human being they act, the empathy they feel is because of how their mind is also being them. That's the, that's the fascinating thing, that the people, when you look at a person, you can never see that person like how they see themselves, you know? You see an impression of them. 
you know now how much you believe that impression is the reality or there's more now that depends on uh, how much uh, uh, you have heard the voice of nature late nature explain it, it uh, speaks the language of rhythms of presence you know there's moments where I would go sit on a park bench kind of cross-legged and I would close my eyes and I would just start breathing and it was kind of like trying to as a I had this kind of a mindset where I was like okay so I'm this consciousness this awareness in a cosmic landscape now there is a chance that I, we as human beings are disconnected from the cosmos you know or there is a chance we it's like organism like and so we are alive as the cosmos is alive that means you and the cosmos are simultaneously alive not just you alive in a lifeless cosmos you know We have to forgive. The atoms that we are being. We have to realize that really novelty is the past's dream. I ask myself every day I have woken up and how many of those days have I actually been looking at the world and seeing what it is before I impose a value? And how many days have I imposed value on the world and blindly ran in my own inner simulations thinking I see the world actually? I am telling you the mind is uh, uh, the mystery of a lifetime. It is that grand Rubik's Cube where the way you live life is the algorithm to it. I remember I was in Rishikesh, India, and I was staying at this ashram for two months, part of this like yoga course, you know, and it's so, it's a hilarious story how I ended up because I had no intention of going to India, you know, and then uh, somehow the opportunity arose and there was a ticket, you know. So anyways, I find myself going to this ashram in Rishikesh called Nikitan Ashram. And it was right beside, uh, I later on found out and I was shocked. It was right beside uh, the Divine Life Society, uh, the Temple of Shivananda and whatnot, you know. And so I remember entering this ashram and I was kind of trying to live this kind of completely pure, you know, free of everything life. And the dinners were these, they had this dinner staff where it seemed like they had always been living already. Like it, it, when I went there, the dinner staff, even the young kids seemed like they were old souls. They had already been living there in, in the place for a long time, you know, not even too poetically metaphysical. It's just like they, they seem to, be, have repeated the same activity to such a degree that they had found a freedom beyond it, you know? Now, I remember there was always a dog and they would cage, they had somehow kind of, it was indoors, the dining hall, because in India there's monkeys. I'm not joking, there's monkeys that they kind of attack where food is and like I remember it's like we, we were... <laughs> I remember it's like I, we went to the yoga class and at the beginning the teacher was singing about all mantras of peace and calmness and gentleness and light and divinity and all this. And after the yoga class, it's as if with this enlight enlightened, blissful mind, the students are going and they suddenly see like the kitchen staff with the stones and sticks are fighting these like savage monkeys who are trying to get food from them. <laughs> You're like, okay, namaste. <laughs> you just, you know, and I realized something about nature. When you accept it, it accepts you.
if you don't accept the nature of even an animal, then you have refused to take part into the... You see, animals don't speak a language, but they acknowledge environment. And when you can acknowledge environments similar to them, it's as if you understand them. Do you know? That means, I, I don't know what it is, but animals uh, communicate through their environment, their natures. You see, it's like the human being is a very advanced program of nature that can now reprogram itself to some degree. You know, it can't even ultimately reprogram itself, but when it builds virtual reality, dig digital simulations of the world, that's when it can, man, that's when Mr. Within will say, man became a god. He created a world that he was the full observer of. What, what is more godly than that? He was a, it was a world where even the programmer of the virtual reality was in. So anyways, guys, I, I hope this talk was helpful. Pretty much uh, the main intention is that realize a new moment means a moment where the past hasn't spoken first. And you can always, just like the refresh browser of a website, refresh the moment through stillness and silence to get a more clear awareness to how things are moving and how uh, pretty much uh, the, uh, what the mind provides is an ability to move the world in multiple, multi, multiple ways, even though the body moves in a certain way. So when they told children to dream, it wasn't, it didn't mean going to an illusion. You know, it didn't mean don't wake up. It, it, they, it meant that care to know what is beyond what is known now. And inevitably, the scholar will come to the logos. The Logos is the living unknown that is where all knowledge is hovering in. And that field is non-dual. So you, you, the, the entrance, it's like the mind for the first time uh, gives a signal or receives a signal uh, uh, that it is no longer separate in the moment as anything. And that's, uh, I don't know how to tell you, but it's like... Um, it's like your whole world uh, takes a shower. Your whole uh, conceptual existence uh, uh, gets fresh air. And then you realize that um, the, uh, the, it's like uh, potential becomes kinetic. You first are running away from the world to find other dimensions. Then you realize all those dimensions are telling you to go back and handle your first dimension. The objective realm is its own teacher. The laws of nature, it's like, are much more evident. It's like, you know, the scientist, uh, scientific mind says, you know, look for yourself. And when the child looks for itself, it sees that its eyes are different. And Mr. Within is saying, don't just look for yourself, look at the self. And then... I find every person's true nature, like once, once you play an instrument at a certain melody, that melody creates a, a sort of rhythm, and that rhythm is your, believe it or not, it's like you and the logos are indistinguishable in that moment. So anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Oh, and one more thing. In the subtitle, I've written Imagination's Footing. And so what does that mean? It's the codependence of abstraction with reality, form and space. Study form and space and you have understood the secrets uh, of intelligence geometrically. I'm telling you, there is a geometrical dimension 
that is not like how can I tell you oh we can play this instrument uh, that is our moment of being our attention can navigate and be piloted with a certain clarity I don't want to even call it clarity with a certain rhythm that it's as if you are bowing to the worlds that are beyond you which you are from it's it's literally a realization of greatness not within the self within the world your mind is your moment that means if human beings were eternal that means the earth was or what i mean by that is that manifestation the song of manifestation continues and that's why every moment has there's this sort of cosmic gratitude when i was sitting on that bench cross-legged i was breathing and with every breath i was trying to get like you know how you check your facebook stat uh a feed you know it was like i was checking my existential you know uh true nature feed <laughs> And it was like, it was for a second just stopping the effort for something to be something and then noticing the magnificent opportunity that absence, emptiness provides for the new. That means behind our eyes, we're no stranger to transformation. Swami Krishnananda, whose temple was right beside where I was staying in Rishikesh, and of course he's passed away, but uh, Swami Krishnananda had this quote where he said, religion is God remembering himself. And somebody hearing that would be like, whoa, that means man never existed? And maybe that's that's the source of endless, uh, that's the how life is a joke. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond language, um, we have to be explorers, and pretty much the educational system is going to, uh, hopefully, civilization 2.0, phase 3, would be the exploration of the inner realms of man and their implication of, for the first time, archetypally becoming part of uh, a galactic sphere. This is, of course, after civilization 2.0, phase 3. So I'm speaking pretty much, hopefully, I don't know if this will ever happen, but like, if this works, what I'm saying, it's like I'm probably those hearing me are gonna be on that sky city. That'd be so epic. Ah, like when I look at this cat's face, I see endless wisdom, guys. I see nature's ability to continuing through its sight. Solar powered minds now fearlessly march into the unknown of the black abyss of space to build the most advanced civilization and to see what, what that would look like. What greater game is there to play? Much blessings and Namaste.